people. So my name is Philip Martin, and I just want to say hello and thank you for coming to uh, join us here today. Uh, I'm the co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery with my partner, Portia Hine, and I hope you've had a chance to meet Portia either at the gallery or at the fairs. I'm really thrilled to have a chance to talk with Tomary Dodge, who has been a decades-long inspiration for me as an artist and a visual thinker. And here we're going to talk about his show, Hair into Gold and Back Again at uh, Philip Martin Gallery. If you have thoughts or questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, but yeah, really excited to get started. Hey, Tomri, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Well, thanks for joining us. I started here. This is a major show for you with major yeah. paintings and, a ma and major new work. Mm -hmm. um, you want to talk a little bit about the title or the works in the show? Where do you want to get started today? Uh, sure, I can, I'll talk about the title really quick. Uh, sure. It's, um, the title's a mistake, actually. It's really funny, <laughs> I think. Um, no. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, I was trying to, um, I was trying to uh, kind of think in terms of, like, alchemical process and uh -huh. color and how, like, these paintings, um, you know, the, the, you know, you've, a lot of it, it's just taking like these basic, basic primary and secondary colors, and mm -hmm. and when they, you know, uh, through visual mixing, they change, they create new colors depending on your distance from the canvas. And I was thinking of that a lot, and uh, you know, kind of like thinking back on fairy tales, and you know, kind of the the, you know, the the, and I'm not like you know I'm not an expert on fairy tales, but there's like the the one of the you know spinning straw into gold, uh -huh. and I somehow misremembered it as like spinning hair into gold for some reason. <laughs> um, so you said, and and then you know I realized that was a mistake, but I liked that title better than yes. So I thought it was much better, so I kept it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the title is kind of refers to like that, that you know, these uh, certainly that that process of visual mixing and, and the use of color in the show, but also just in terms of like you know painting generally and, and yeah. you know ways of, of of building images, creating images through right. paint, especially in the kind of processes I'm using in this show. Um, yeah. You know, having the the images you know form. Um, kind of you know fall apart again depending on uh, the viewer's relationship to the painting yeah well so you know i think um that makes me really thrilled i mean what's the basic of painting it's a happy accident in a certain mm -hmm. sense and um the idea that the title itself is kind of mixed up in the remembering of something or the creating of something seems to get to the heart of what these paintings are i mean painting is nothing if not figuration meaning that you of course, there's figuration in the school, but there's also figuring the idea that an idea has to actually be made in physical paint. You know, the famous matrix of applied physical signs of brush marks. Mm -hmm. so you want to talk a little bit about when you talk about optical mixing, um, what what that what you mean by that, so that people kind of have a sense of of what. Yeah, that I mean, is. I think I think people kind of all probably already have a general idea of what that means, although they may not be familiar with the term. I mean, mm -hmm. it's uh, probably I, I I think like someone like Surratt would be the uh, prime example of you know right. you know with like the pointillist technique of these little dots of of you know in in many cases like pretty high key saturated color but mm -hmm. you know they're seen from a distance those colors will blend together and create like more subtle tones um you know and you know, he, he, of course like i think you know someone like monet too used a lot i think impressionism generally kind of you know is is uh thought of as as you utilizing um optical mixing mm -hmm. um but uh, you know in in uh, more general terms i mean it, you, you, it's you know how we pretty much experience like things uh uh increasingly throughout the day i mean that's how screens work you mm -hmm. know uh you know if you were to zoom in on like this the screen you're watching right now you're going to see like uh you know uh, uh red green and blue pixels you know yeah. that's down to so um uh yeah that's 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 what i uh, you know i mean by optical mixing and, and trying sorry 
Oh no, go ahead. And and trying to you know really um, uh, utilize that to some degree in these paintings and um, uh, explore that a little from like a painterly perspective. I, I mm -hmm. think. You know, it's been uh, really interesting for me. Well, it's interesting because, of course, with Seurat, um, you know, he's very overtly responding to new understandings of how the eye works um, that I can never quite remember the, the person's name. But if one looks it up, it's not Cheval because that's horse in French, I think. I'm not a good French person. This is my Indiana French. Yeah. Um, but it's something like that. And so, you know, Impressionists, obviously, were a part of a changing world. We see them historically, um, but their whole sense of what humans were was changing. We are at a point right now when our whole sense of what humans are is changing. Um, painting, to me, seems like this incredible thing with regard to uh, human expression and what our own individuality is. And at the same time, as you as you're it's very interesting that it's also an example of objective things as well as subjective things like how the eye actually works as we navigate other um technologies as another kind of parallel screens as you mentioned and even perception itself and so there actually is a, a interesting question someone emailed me which was to ask where does the idea of perception fitting in your work right now um, I think it's really key. I mean, the the I and it kind of you know it, if people haven't seen the show in person and are able to, I strongly suggest they go see it in person because these uh, paintings, you know, really do uh, transform depending on your relationship to them. And I think well, you literally have no idea what these paintings are if you don't look at them within five inches, even if you're in the room itself. And this is gonna be an interesting one because I don't normally have a lot of detail shots. Normally I just zoom into the painting, <laughs> but we can't do that here because the camera cannot handle what is going on within five inches. It has no ability to record it whatsoever. Yeah. It's literally probably against how it's program sorry didn't mean to go off there but but yeah yeah but please exactly. express yourself yeah yeah no exactly so so you know i think you know the, if you when you experience these paintings in person they they will change depending on your distance from them they mm -hmm. do kind of uh they they kind of get uh what what i um uh, refer to as like optically reactive uh, mm -hmm. They, they 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 will kind of vibrate and shimmer you know um and they're actually i think like very slow paintings despite the fact that they're oh. uh, you know at first seem like very kind of, may seem kind of garish or, or like really you know um intense to look at if you kind of give it a, a, a bit of time they they really kind of unfold slowly yeah. and, and reveal themselves you know uh um, much more in like a, you know, with a prolonged um, viewing, I think. Um, now, yeah. with regard to the question about perception, is perception itself as a human experience something that you're thinking about? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think always, you know, yeah. in terms of painting, but especially with uh, this new body of work, I think it's... Um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, there's there's that kind of old adage that like, you know, the painting is is completed by the viewer. And I think mm -hmm. with this work, that's especially true, mm -hmm. uh, you know, more so than, you know, with any other work I've made. Can um, we talk a little bit about what it's like to be in the nuts and bolts of of actually laying down brushstrokes while at the same time thinking about what the viewer's response is going to be to it perceptually? Yeah, um, because uh, the, the really when I'm working on these paintings, I don't know uh, how they're going to end up or what they're going to be like in the end. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, they're exciting to work on for that reason. Um, you know, people might not like, uh, people might not imagine that like, you know, painting, uh, you know, little squares for like, you know, three days straight is, is exciting. <laughs> It actually, you know, when I work on these, it actually is because, you know, they, they um, that that kind of uh, effect does not really come into being until like all those squares are painted. And then right. you kind of 
really they really kind of um you know uh start to they, they turn into something or they you know they're, they're they become something else um so yeah that's um, really that's really fascinating um it that reminds me of something that bernard pifferetti said who is a painter who's who paints one side and then he paints yeah, the other right. side mm -hmm. and people are always asking these kinds of questions like, well, which side did you do first or are they doing them together or whatever? And they also ask questions like um, basically when is it done? And what's really interesting is he points out like he doesn't know, he doesn't experience it as a thing until those two sides are there because the two relationships, mm -hmm. then that's what's happening. Um, so I find I, that was just a parallel in terms of yeah, the no, process of, of working on something and really not knowing where, where it's going. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm going to sure. break the fourth wall because I usually share my screen, but I want just to do this so that people can see the preview window. Cause I think it will help them see the color up close as opposed mm -hmm. to overall. I think this is going to work. I don't know. I hope so. So if we look at this, I just want to point out the can you are you seeing what i'm seeing is this working mm -hmm. okay yeah. so i just want to point out the difference between the color and the detail and yeah. color and the overall how what is that effect what would you what would you describe describe that oh i don't i don't know what 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 to, if there, i don't have a term for it necessarily okay, yeah. i guess that the way i phrase that is just kind of a dumb question i guess what i'm just saying is like were you surprised like how did you come into working like this um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, I think the kind of um, the pattern has been like these patterns have been present in the work for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and usually kind of in the past, like occupied like a kind of a negative space kind of role where they like would isolate like a, mm -hmm. you know, what I, I would loosely term a figure or like some kind of you know uh, object in the painting and uh, and you know, figure and object you know used in like in you know in abstract sense mm -hmm. but uh, you know they would kind of uh um activate space that way and mm -hmm. um slowly they've become i think uh, a little more and more prominent you know in the work and so mm -hmm. like the work they've really kind of become um you know inseparable from the rest of the painting you know they, 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 they've 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 become kind of the painting itself mm -hmm. even though you know there's there, obviously there's tons of uh painting underneath those patterns and oftentimes in some of these paintings like multiple layers of patterns um, yeah been painted over and over again yeah uh, yeah i mean they, they they do kind of uh you know they they on one hand work as uh kind of filters i guess you could say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, uh, they kind of slightly obscure all that previous work, that previous, mm -hmm. painting, while still kind of, you know, um, leaving it evident. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because, you know, when we talked about this originally and when we've talked about it in other conversations, you know, I as viewer obviously had no idea where these are going. And that's really what's so fun about working with artists that you, um, that like really someone who's really good, I guess for lack of any other way to say it, is that, you know, you don't know where something is going when you're as intimately a viewer for them as a gallerist and an artist, but you're not surprised somehow when you get there. And because um, it makes sense within the language of understanding one's own work. And as that language develops and starts to change. And when you talked about this originally, and I realized this in doing the press release that, um, well, first of all, in doing the press release, I realized you've been working with p patterns like like this for almost 10 years. But when mm -hmm. we first talked about it, maybe 2019, you mentioned more sort of synthetic cubism and how maybe Brock might paint a newspaper uh, if people can envision kind of that use of, of stuff. And I and I personally thought more about describing the picture plane, um, showing people its flatness, as it were. Um, but with this movement into, um, into the kind of painting, like that is just amazing to me. Like when you look at the color here and you look at it, at it here with this movement into 
what you're describing, it almost is sort of interesting. It's it's um, it it's like uh, I I tend to the, the comment the thing I think about is opticality, which was mm -hmm. a Clement Greenberg term to talk about high modernism and to talk yeah. about which is an amazing part of American art that obviously we know about or art making, but in a certain sense because of Greenberg's own criticism and in the power of it and people just being tired of being told what to do the achievements of people like Alitsky or Poons to some degree we forget um because the whole mob that whole thing for time for there was all this other stuff where people were reacting against painting and doing all that that's <laughs> too many thoughts in relationship to my broad and no doubt fallacious uh description of contemporary the advent of contemporary art um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, references. The question is, is, or is, is, opt, is, uh, was something left on the table with opticality almost? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, I think definitely, I mean, you know, I think, you know, those paintings, like, like those Larry Coons paintings, I think, uh, I, I love those. And I, I love, I love the idea of opticality. I like, I, you know, I really like, uh, the idea of op art, you know? Yeah. All most of most of it is kind of like not terrible, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> um but you know but you do have uh people like bridget riley who are just yeah. like i mean they, they they kind of take that they use that um that opticality you know to like this greater more poetic end you know yeah not just an end in itself you know yeah. i think like op art kind of did but you know people like her you know took it to uh you know a greater end and and you know I'm, I'm definitely interested in that i'm interested in like you know using that uh that that opticality that optically reactive you know um kind of uh phenomena that paintings can produce and and kind of you know yeah hopefully take it to it use it as a, to a greater artistic end you know and and this uh, i have a point about bridget riley but just while this is on the screen this painting is called split and um, you want to talk about just compositionally? Because I've always been really fascinated with the composition on this particular painting. Um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, it, it, that, I don't know, where do I start with this one? It's like, <laughs> yeah, I, um, This was one of the earlier paintings in this body of work. And it was, I, when I, started on it, it I kind of felt like it um I needed to make some kind of uh break with uh, a lot of the the kind of compositions I'd been using previous mm -hmm. last few years and this you know obviously like I this this was probably the um the, the most like uh abstract uh, uh composition I've worked with in a long time oh that's interesting um, up to that point yeah totally um, so i don't like, think i thought about that but that's totally yeah. true yeah and so it was you know it was a way of kind of uh you know that notion of using the uh dimensions of the canvas as to, to kind of inform what goes on inside of it mm -hmm. but not kind of uh you know be totally limited by that either like uh you mm -hmm. know uh, you know, it's like, you know, think of like those, how, how like those uh, early uh, Stella paintings were made, you know, mm -hmm. they really just, you know, they're, they're almost like, you know, kind of repetitive tracings of the dimensions of the canvas and some yeah. way, but like, you know, maybe subdivided in, 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 um, in different ways. And I, I was, I was thinking of those a lot. I mean, I love yeah. those, those black paintings. Yeah. Um, so those were, those were on my mind. Um, but uh, also, I uh, you know I decided to um, uh, work kind of with that in mind, but also without using uh, a straight a straight lines necessarily or, or yeah. like a straight edge. I mean, it's it's a wonky shape, you know. Yeah. And it's done by hand, you know. There, yeah. There's like there's you know I don't I, I never use tape. Ed, first yeah. of all, an old thing of mine like don't use tape. Um, but I, you know, I often won't even use a straight edge for stuff like this. Right. So like if things get wonky, things get like kind of skewed pretty easily. And it's like, 
I, I, I like that. I, you know, I, I, yeah. I, I, will, I will let that kind of do those. I, I, I let mistakes and, and accidents kind of direct the work as much as I can in that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, there, it's interesting because that then, I mean, there's a lot in there. I just want to point out that you, you know, that there's a lot of really important points that you, you made in there. Um, you know, this point with regard to composition relationship to the edge and talk of the, of the, the parameters of the actual support of the painting itself. Mm -hmm. And um, then also your point about um, not using tape. You know, that also, of course, reminds me of this moment that we had that's famous in my own head in terms of my understanding of what you're doing, which was that coming out of the 90s, um, being educated in the late 90s, um, you know, the, the relationship of painting to photography, a la Richter, was such a very specific thing. And that actually brings into another question. But at that time... I assume that your early paintings, which were kind of, dis we'll just call them dystopic landscapes for lack mm -hmm. of any other way. I assume that you paint them from photographs. And then you were like, no, never, which is because you were inventing pictorial systems yeah. to, to create those things. And right. it's really interesting that that continuation of the primacy of the pictorial system, rather than some sort of depictive system for lack of a better right. description is is really where it's at because pictorial yeah. systems sort themselves out like in this painting here you don't the you, you know it, it maybe it led you to opticality in a certain sense like you don't need us the eye doesn't need a straight edge to put its to put its skills to work to try to make sense of this and yeah. essentially that's what happens in paintings once you create a framework by which something is interpretable it's off to the races as far as the human brain and the observer goes. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, it's funny, this, uh, I, this painting is really interesting be, for me because um, uh, probably more so than any of the other paintings in the show, like mm -hmm. it, there's uh, not much to it in terms of like, you know, figure, uh, figuration or kind of figure ground thing. I mean, it is, yeah. it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's um it's it's just it's just flat but it becomes very spatial and very deep yeah you know? um and and the forms you know just start to like uh you know move around and kind of build themselves within this painting if you uh if you you know give it a a, a, a decent a decent viewing you know and there's also a lot of, you know, this is what I'm saying. If one thinks about these other, the details, like we just can't see it, you know, color wise, but there's also a lot of really interesting moments in here. Like we're not, this is another thing I think with your part, your patterns or the way you're painting is that there's, I always have to really point out to people that there's not, well, I don't have to, but there's not any like autopilot. It's not like you're like, I'm going to paint green lines across this whole thing. And when I get to the other side, we'll be done. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of moving and acting, mm -hmm. you know, and the patterns, yeah. we read them as some kind of consistent overall, but then what's actually happening as they reach the thing that they're, say, going over or in relationship to, you make a lot of choices yeah. on that scale. Yeah, I'll, 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 you know, I, I'll play kind of games with myself when I'm working. <laughs> And then where you know, and I'll ch you know, I'll set up some rules and I'll change the rules like as I'm yeah. going. But you know, I always I, I do like uh, the kind of foregrounding, like the you know the the more random aspects yeah. of the painting, or like the you know the the drips or just weird things that happen. Like yeah. I you know, so I I usually like you know will go around those and let those like really come forward. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is just like. I have so much fun doing that. <laughs> well, as you point out, three yeah. days into into dot patterns, you gotta yeah, you gotta figure something out there. Yeah. Um, this painting is called uh, December Boys, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, we're just gonna keep keep going going through here. I wanted to come back. To, uh, I'm also going to say that my I'm really enjoying talking with you, so I hope it's okay if we maybe go a little bit over what we normally do. Sure. It's already 25 minutes in, but I suspect we might go to 940 on this one. And there's yeah. tons of people still coming into the webinars. Actually, the number's going up, not down. So seemingly that's good. 
I wanted to make this interesting point or wanted to ask you about um, or say something that just because I want to shoot my mouth off, which is that, you know, with your point on Bridget Riley, you mentioned that Bridget Riley, and I think I'm very interested that you brought her up because I'm always really fascinated with her. We talked about op art. That was the lead into that. Mm -hmm. And she is op art. She's often what people think of, but she's so not op art to me in so many ways. She um, made an ama wrote an amazing, amazing, very good essay on Paul Clay for anyone that... Um, you know, is is interested in reading more. You and I have talked about Paul Clay quite a bit. He's someone that I'm personally really fascinated with because I think he's one of the most complicated and sophisticated artists out there that I can see, but I, for years, had no idea what he's doing and still basically don't. Yeah. Get, the point I'm getting to is that um, Bridget Riley says, uh, makes in her writing about Paul Clay, and then there's another person who wrote this big essay also in the same book, and I've forgotten what his name is, but he's some kind of expert, is just saying that Paul Clay got lumped in with surrealism because the assumption is that he's subjective, but that the reality is that he's actually totally objective with regard mm -hmm. to how the mind and the brain really work. Yeah. And it's uh, very interesting because you had also made a point with regard to Bridget Riley that it's not op art because op art is usually this kind of end in itself. And, and that's like, that's not interesting. Right. <laughs> Ultimately. Yeah. Like where's, because, but you said it's about poetry mm -hmm. and that's obviously kind of vague, but do you want to talk a little bit about, I think of poetry and painting as being about knowing your language, violating it, sharing that with the viewer, participating in that generosity. Do you have any response to any of that kind of random? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's right. I, I mean, yeah, it's trying to like, nail down what I meant by, by poetry. I think, um, you know, I mean, in, in that example, you know, it's like, I think most op art kind of, you know, you get that thing to happen, right? That that optical illusion mm -hmm. to happen at that point. And then someone like Bridget Riley comes along and and that, that when that thing happens, that's like the starting point, right? Mm -hmm. That you, that becomes that that uh, that, uh, that optical illusion, say, become is is like you know that's the basis for the language she uses to mm -hmm. you know more um, evocative and 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 you know uh, beautiful in, in, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. So yeah, that 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 notion of language, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, of like visual language and using it, um, you know to to like uh you know more sophisticated complex ends i guess yeah you know? and also it's interesting like this painting has a really beautiful title it's called when we talk about love mm -hmm. i don't know if that's an allusion to raymond carver but that's who it makes me think of there's totally an allusion to raymond carver <laughs> it's but, a beautiful but phrase. it's also but it's also uh, uh just like you know um the I was kind of thinking about like, you know, when you try to describe or define anything and mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, how how complex and difficult that can be. And yeah, you know, sort of like, you know, uh yeah, yeah, big uh, Raymond Carver fan, of course, too. But and and that that title, I've always loved the title of that totally. story. It yeah. does seem like the titles in the show are particularly thought out, if I might say so. Yeah. Um yeah, right. Can we talk just a little, one more thing? I know we're kind of on this painting and as we move forward, a big topic in painting is edge, where things come together. It has a lot to do with the creation of pictorial space. Um, you can create edge with a line that maybe de delineates that. You can also, you want to talk just a little bit about edge? Like, cause I think like the way these, these shapes are interacting and such as one, perceives this as an atmosphere is just really a re is really remarkable do you want to talk a little bit about edge in some of these paintings yeah i mean a lot of those those shapes and the, like the kind of geometric forms i guess you know they're almost like collage -y looking uh -huh. forms. and it's you like, make a lot of paintings from collages i might mention that people might not know that but uh, like well i don't or correct me. please correct me <laughs> yeah i don't make paintings from collages i make a lot of collages and i make uh -huh. a lot of and the, the 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 paintings kind of sometimes will end up looking like you know collages, but 
They're not made from collagen. So interesting parallel. What I'm talking about is that you, Tom has a very active work on paper process. Um, it can be watercolors, which we should do a we we should do a conversation about those at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can also be, uh, all kinds of line drawings and stuff, but there's also a collage aspect that could be anything from patterns to new, new uh, magazine images and, and, and doing things. So just to make that, uh, point. So, sorry, go ahead. You're just saying it's a parallel process. It's not a study for. Yeah, it's a parallel process. Um, but you know, I think that the kind of the way a lot of the, the, these forms show up in the paintings, I mean, they're very kind of collage -y. They look like something that could have been glued down there, you know, cut cut from something else and glued down there. Yeah. In actuality, what most of them are is underpainting. They're like, uh, uh. they're, they're um, you know, previous layers from the painting that I have not painted over. Mm -hmm. um, that are kind of the, they're kind of the opposite of, of what they uh, often present as. Oh, interesting. Okay, got it. Um. Um. And of course, that's not always the case, but generally, I would say that that's often the case. Right. Um, and as far as like the, the quality of edge, you know. Um, so you're talking. We're talking about something like like this, for example. Yeah. 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 That's like an. Uh, and then, of course, edge. You see so many. But go ahead. Yeah. You. Go yeah. Ahead. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's, there's all the different ways you can think of to like create edges in these paintings. Yeah. You now, um, you know, I'll I'll use any any way I can. Um, that I can find, you know, uh, um, but yeah, we, but you know, I, uh, I sometimes uh, I'll, there'll be like a fair amount of drawing in them that usually gets covered up. Although sometimes, you know, you'll see there's like some uh, charcoal lines that are still evident in the paintings. Um, uh, you know, using those kind of like neon marks that um, you know that's another kind of kind of way of drawing. I mm -hmm. think of. In the paintings, um, uh, but yeah, and then and then you know like kind of those blocky forms. Um, those uh, and those will, like I said previously, those are often like you know leftover uh, underpainting. Um, and you know, I, you know, it, it all kind of just freeform those. I won't, I, like I said, I don't tape things off. I I, I rarely will like uh, um, you know use a straight edge to to kind of. Uh, you know, make a straight line. Um, yeah. They, I mean, it, they, they, all the paintings are all like really loose, even though they yeah. don't all that way at, at a distance. And if you get up close, you can tell like everything's like done pretty loosely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, and, you know, they're like, they're, they're pretty sloppy, you know, <laughs> I think a lot of ways. I mean, the, you, you, oh, they're even, so sloppy. <laughs> even, the, even the patterns, the, the way the patterns are painting it. I mean, you know, I, I think I I think that that you know I'm I'm I tend to be a sloppy painter, you know. Well, <laughs> well I hope that the audience can come and observe your sloppiness and hold you yeah. to account for it because that would awesome. be very good. Yeah. Um, in the Q and A, we have a lot. Uh, nope. We don't normally have a lot, but we do have a lot. So I'm just going to take a quick look. The painter that I mentioned, his name is Bernard Pifferetti. He's a French painter. Uh, P I Pifferetti, P I F F A R E T T I, very significant, interesting painter uh, from the that I used to work with him. There's stuff on our website. If you look at past shows, he shows with um, different, you know, with uh, what does he show with um, what you call it? Uh, well, Franco Boz in Paris, and and he's very interesting because he has a timeline that's like Pollock, Viola. Pontai, like a very interesting Christopher Williams and very interesting timeline. Um, okay, so we have a couple for you here, which is um, interesting. Um, one person is saying that they noticed this repeat of zigzag uh, and dots over the years. Um, have you gained uh, an insight uh, with relationship to these patterns the more you use them? And and is there a value to you of returning to familiar shapes and patterns from previous works? And this is, just for reference, a previous work. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, 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 I'll, uh, you know, you, I use those patterns um, 
it's kind of like you know you collecting tools in the toolboxes right. often think about it and so you know it's like you know you'll, sometimes they'll pull this pattern out sometimes i'll pull that pattern out um right and so i'll reuse stuff like yeah yeah quite often um right. and just depends on you know uh what i want to um or what i think will happen usually because i'm usually wrong but uh but like uh you know what what i what i kind of think will uh will will be the result you know um determines what pattern i'll use um so yeah um yeah and with a healthy respect for the present um moment we can't step in the same river twice i guess but it's nice to know that we could drown in the river at any time it's it's around <laughs> us. Okay. Yeah. someone yeah. also con at, made a question with regard to pro process and and being a process artist i don't know what a, if i know what a process artist is exactly do you know what a process artist is um, i don't know i have like a vague kind of idea yeah. of what that tends to i'll have to look me. i'll have to look that up i feel like again with the attentiveness to the present I mean, moment I basically, I basically, you're in the process so i i don't even yeah, i don't I quite know it, but. i think of it as someone you know an artist who kind of like you know for lack of a better word doesn't know what they're doing um and that's how, <laughs> that's how i think of myself i think, I think it's um, an art historical school topic i don't know yeah, if it's quite that. yeah I, I like uh you know i it's but you know you have these kind of processes that you know you rely on to make work and you don't you don't start with like this predetermined vision or idea or plan yeah. That's yeah. like the process. You 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 allow you, you have this process and you allow it to unfold. Yeah, um, that's how I think of like. Yeah, that. that makes sense. That makes sense. That's good. Um, and then I this is the last uh, painting, and a person just made a a really nice comment about poetry as a multivalent language, which is really uh, pretty and um, and poetic themselves. So I appreciate that comment. Is there anything that you might like to say that we have not said thus far, or? Oh, no. Okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, everything I've said is in the paintings. Um, everything it, that hopefully that I, you know, that I might say is in the paintings. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny to put this body of work out, you know, at this uh, time in history, I think, sure. because it's really, um, it's, to me it really kind of comes out of this particular cultural historical moment and yeah. technological moment more yeah. than any work i've ever made yeah um, also is kind of ironic because while it may be um you know that may be the case it's like they really i think need to be seen in person which totally is, proposition in like instagram age yeah, yeah. you know it's like true. if it's you true. if you're looking at them on your phone it's like you kind of get it but yeah. you're not getting it like they they are um yeah well, to that point, we're going to have a major presentation of Tomri's work in Miami, if you're at the art fair. Um still figuring out our booth and um how we're going to do that. There's <laughs> For a little bit of behind the scenes, uh, Tari, I haven't even discussed this. The hilarity in these booths in Miami is that because the, the Swiss booths are amazing, the walls are amazing, but they are a bunch of free form, freestanding walls. And once you start hanging stuff on them, they'll obviously go like this. So you need to have walls to support your booth walls, and then they affect your neighbor's booth walls. So there's some kind of like... <laughs> We happen to be in this place where like everyone is trying to support everyone else's walls and it's it's a funny thing. So we're trying to figure it out, but we're gonna have a big presentation in Miami because we we have to show these works, which is really exciting. Um, I know I said we would leave, but I wanna make this other comment because I've been thinking about it, which is there's the famous, going back to the Richter point, there's this famous De La Roche comment, De La Roche, the French painter, 1830, is gonna be my ballpark guess who on seeing photography says after this painting is dead. And I think it's probably one of the first times people use the painting is dead phrase. Mm -hmm. His point is that in relationship to the depictive power of photography, what point is there for painting? Mm -hmm. And then it's very interesting because then we have 
the you know the the modernist timeline which is you know yeah like they then they make all the good games <laughs> that's what happens ah it's so funny well it's funny because i was reading today about how goga gogan uh sorry van gogh like really did not like Ang angra and mm -hmm. uh it's also really funny because uh peter saul who i was used to was his teaching assistant that was like for him that was like the, the top and he called jackson pollock art about art supplies and it was all like that yeah, <laughs> but the interesting point just being that um just being that um so then what's really interesting is that going back to the 90s with richter richter really does this expert conversation about painting and photography and and, and is very much a painter and and i was just talking to someone at our opening about the buclo richter interviews which if you've never read them are really really amazing yeah. and what's really amazing about them in one way and i get to my point but i just am shooting my mouth off here is that um Buclo has this idea of what painting is in the 90s, you know, that it's ironic and it's going to be the, I guess, I, I don't know if ironic is the right word, but he's like, he keeps trying to tell Richter, yeah, but you don't believe in painting, you know, you're just doing this thing to show and Richter keeps being like, no, actually, I'm a painter and that's why yeah. I'm doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and Luke yeah. like, you don't really believe that, blah, blah, blah. And over and over and over again, Richter looks at all of those things acknowledges what Buclo is saying is true, but says, I'm a painter and that's why I'm doing it. And it's this interesting thing, which is that Buclo, because he's not a painter, doesn't really understand in some sense, the totality of what painting is and why we actually have to do it. Mm -hmm. And then that leads me into this point with regard to, you know, then when I first saw your work coming out of school in the late nineties, there was the whole conversation about the bits and bytes of computer practice computers and and the bits of bite of painting which could be brush strokes and blah 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 uh, like a monet is like and you you talked about the digitization of the screen and your long-standing interest in that and pixels and that's in the press release too and then just fast forwarding here we are with ai and the possibility that you could fall in love with someone like and they're a chat bot or whatever yeah. it just really feels like we're in this very interesting moment where with regard to like a kind of corporate messaging, media, fascism and politics, like how we really treat one another, painting and other handmade mediums like this, be they ceramics or sculpture or whatever. And I'm not dissing on any of the mediums, love them all. That's not really what I'm saying. Just it feels like painting has this particular voice at the moment that is really important in terms of us understanding our humanity. I, I mean, painting can be critiqued, obviously, as this for its money aspects and how it's this certain kind of backbone of the economic aspect of the art world and totally get yeah. that. But part of that is the fact that people want, are really connected to painting and, and as, as a result. So that's a very long, you might disagree with any parts of it, but what about painting is just, you kind of mentioned this and that's what made me sort of think this, it, having a particular role to play right now or a kind of, it just feels yeah. so radical in a way. Does that resonate with I mean, you? It, yeah, it, it definitely resonates with me. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, it's, I often think it's kind of funny because, you know, we can talk about all this stuff and this technological moment we're in and how like painting's always responding to, uh, these uh, technological developments. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, you know, in my studio, I'm basically <laughs> using century technology. Like, it's all, you know, I'm, you know, it's like, that's so great. It's like, I'm using, I, I use, I use paint and brushes, you know, and yeah. that's, a, that's kind of it, you know. Like, I don't, I don't project stuff. I don't, you know, I don't use Photoshop or anything. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and it's not, I don't have anything against that, but it's just like, I, it, it just, to me, it just seems like it just complicates stuff and gets in the way. So, yeah. Well, yeah. Tomri, once again, you have demonstrated your wisdom. I am, a, I am Buclo right now and you are Richter slipping out the <laughs> door. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I really appreciate your taking the time. Um, if you're in LA and want to stop by the gallery, that would be wonderful. And of course, we're in Miami. If you have any questions about, about anything you've seen or you want to just send me an email, please feel free. And thanks so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Tomri, for an amazing body of work and privilege of showing it. And I really, it's really fantastic. So talk to you later.
Thanks. Bye. Okay.